So who are you and what do you do? I'm Anthony Scaramucci. I am a serial entrepreneur. I just sold my second business and I spent 11 days as the White House communications director. But prior to that, I was on the president's executive transition team and I worked on his uh, fundraising. You have <coughs> been on the media quite a bit, is that right? I spent a lot of time in the media and since the White House, I've been the focus of a lot of a media intention, uh, attention, yes. What's your opinion of the media generally? I would say the in general impression of the media for me is that uh, there's a lot of pockets of dishonesty and they have fragmented into a different business model than the one I grew up with as a kid. and so. Uh, when I learned about journalism in school, there was an objective standard and the front page was about trying to get the story right and cleansed of any political bias. Uh, but because of what's happened with the advent of social media, Twitter, Facebook, guys like Mike Cernovich, uh, they have fractured the old media and they've turned this into business models that are trying to get to a certain segment of the population. And so they are trying to reinforce biases, re reinforce opinions of that segment. So when people turn on the TV or they go to their website or they pick it up in hard copy, uh, they're reading things that they like. It's sort of what happened with cable television too. We've got 300 channels, but each of us is only watching one or two channels. So, so the media has destroyed itself in an effort to remain profitable. The record, so that's an interesting point I wanna talk about a little bit because CNN is gonna have its biggest year yet. All these people who talk about Trump has declared a war on the press, if you look at their balance sheets, these are, that's a massively successful year. What's your take on that? Well, I think, I think that the business model is working from a relates to the profitability. So what the decision was to fragment and segment and go after, if you're CNN liberals or MSNBC liberals or Fox conservatives, that has been a very good business strategy because you get a lot of advertising revenue, a lot of advertising dollars, and you're getting a lot of sub fees from the cable operators, uh, but it has destroyed journalism. And so you, if you wanna bifurcate the two things, great business model, they've got the celebrity president, the celebrity apprentice host as the president, uh, a real estate developer that has had high brand name recognition in the United States for about 40 years. Uh, and so he's also a smash mouth, uh, counter punching, not gonna take any guff from those outlets that are targeting him. And so that creates the hysteria that's relating to these ratings and the profitability. When I say the media, what does that mean to you? When you say the word media to me, my raw shot chest is, I better get my cup on, protect everything underneath my belt, and put a crash helmet on, and wait to see what happens. Who do you think of specific personalities or brands when I say the media? Well, my favorite people in the media that show my bias are guys like Mike Cernovich. Uh, uh, Sean Hannity is one of my best friends. Uh, Bill O'Reilly, I'm not close to personally, but I respect him as a journalist and as an, uh, uh, an objective opinion maker. Uh, I like Lou Dobbs. Those are kind of the people that I associate myself with who I think, think the way I do. Uh, uh, the flip side is I can't tell you that I disrespect Rachel Maddow. I think Rachel Maddow... Uh, has a, an, a point of view. I think she's honest about it and has high integrity in terms of delivering that point of view. Now, it may be wildly different from my point of view. Lawrence O'Donnell, I think he's a complete piece of shit. And uh, I think, you know, he's just got really bad karma, so I expect really bad things to happen to him. Yeah, I'm surprised he hasn't been caught up in all this stuff. Well, I mean, you know, he's hitting me when I was, Lawrence O'Donnell was hitting me when I was in the White House. I'm laughing. I mean, this guy's a joke. I mean, you know, he's probably got a zero to negative net worth, and he's obviously unintelligent. So it's just a matter of time before a show gets canceled. Well, I mean, I was thinking more in terms of <clears throat> the harassment stuff because a friend of mine, she said she was on set one day on um, Lawrence O'Donnell's thing. This is right at the time where he had that meltdown. I don't know if you saw the video where he goes, stop the hammer. Yeah, no, I retweeted that. So I had a retreat to Lawrence, Lawrence O'Donnell. I mean, in fairness, he said I was the stupidest person that ever worked in the White House which I thought was funny because if you divided my IQ by 100, you're getting to four times his IQ. So I just think it's funny. But, but then he was like upset with me for some of the remarks that I made off the record to a dishonest journalist. And he's out there screaming, stop the hammering and yelling all these expletives. Uh, one of the things about me that I don't like about people like Lawrence O'Donnell is they treat subordinates very rudely. 
Okay, my grandmother came to the country, started out as a maid. So anybody that's in a service position for me, I've got to treat with respect and dignity and kindness. They could be my grandmother circa 1923. So I find Lawrence O'Donnell, of all the people in the American media, the most despicable person. Yeah, he's one of the only people I think is like a bad person. So Jake yeah. Paper, I might troll, or Ryan Spelter, I might troll, but I don't think that they're fundamentally bad people. Oh, uh, Jake Taper, to me, I think he will give a fair interview. He may not have my point of view, but I bet on his air he gives a fair interview. Chris Cuomo and I uh, share the same heritage, but we're very different ideologically. But Chris Cuomo will let you talk. He'll give you a fair interview. Uh, Brian Stelter, uh, when I had the CNN debacle for me, and just to remind people, uh, three CNN journalists wrote a fake news story about me personally. They got it from who they thought was a very good source inside the White House, so they thought it was 100% true that I was involved in some kind of Russian hysteria. Of course, that wasn't true, and thankfully, I have a deep pocket and a set of uh, you-know-whats, and I went right after those guys. I got all three of those guys fired, and, and basically, I explained to their bosses that if you don't fire them, we're going to end up in a fight with the FCC, and I'm going to try to get your license taken away while you're going through the AT&T Time Warner merger. So, so you have to fight back. If you do not fight back, They'll pitch and roll you and flatten you out. Okay, so my experience leaving the White House is an example of that. I said three curse words on a recorded phone line. They treated it like it was I, I, I poured hot water on a newborn baby. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So, so for me, uh, I find the faux outrage, the mock outrage to be reprehensible. Yeah, that was one thing we wanted to talk to you about, actually. And, and also, too, we want the, the CNN story. And we also want to talk about... Them. more recently, they're trying to claim that you and your Jewish business partner are a Holocaust denier. Yeah, this is this sort of nonsense. So, by the way, I, and, my, and I'm stated up front, you know, my, my Jewish business partner who lost family members in the Holocaust reacted to an Anne Frank costume that was put up on Amazon.com. So the 13-year-old young girl that wrote a diary while she was in hiding and was eventually killed by the Nazis, uh, people are trivializing her by putting out a Halloween costume. And so this gentleman who grew up as an Orthodox, uh, in the Orthodox Jewish community here in New York, uh, was upset about that. And he was trying to make a point through the Scaramucci Post that uh, many Americans and many people in general are not aware of the magnitude of the Holocaust atrocity. And so, uh, but you know, I'm a little cross with him because he put it out as a poll uh, and it immediately got people like Jake Taper and these other guys, it was like a dog whistle for them. And they started going berserk, and they were trying to say that we were uh, opening up a seam for Holocaust deniers to slip through and white supremacists and so on and so forth. And because of my Trump affiliation, they like to label you that way. The first move for the radical left media is to label you a sexual harasser, a racist, or a misogynist, something like that to start the conversation. So they, they have to take you and two-dimensionalize you and characterize you so that they can uh, prevent you from getting your voice out there. So a guy like me, I got raised in a blue collar family. I went to Tufts and Harvard Law School, built two businesses in the United States that I sold for nine figures each, uh, had a television show that I hosted. And so I have a pretty strong opinion, pretty strong political philosophy. And I'm also a guy that can deliver that information to people that I grew up with. And so I've got to be destroyed by these guys. They got to find something on me. I sort of feel bad for them because they, they figured I'm Italian and they got 28 years on Wall Street. I had to do something dishonest. So they spent seven months like ripping through my financial records and background, couldn't find anything. So they got me on three curse words and tried to characterize me like I was, uh, you know, um, Jim Tan Laundry from the Jersey Shore. All fine. I can take it. I'm a big boy. And uh, they're not going to win because I know how to fight back. But people that don't know how to fight back get demolished and they get put into the corner in their little shame box with their dunce cap on, you know. They've tried to take Mike Cernovich as an example and build him a shame box and stick him in the corner uh, and have him face the corner. And he's a guy that fights his way out of a box like that. And so that's me. And that's why these guys are gonna lose because they've never seen guys like me or Michael Cernovich uh, in the new media space that can fight back and have the verbal dexterity and also the intellectual data uh, to push back on these bozos. And here's another thing I will say about the mainstream journalists and I saw this inside the White House, outside the White House, they don't do a lot of homework. So their, their information is this thin 
the Holocaust poll comes out on the uh, Scaramucci Post, they go crazy, but they don't even read the tweets related to it or the context that the poll was put into. Here's the Anne Frank thing. It's a disgrace. 35% of the American people are not aware of the magnitude of the polling. And then, of course, my Jewish partner, I'm saying the word Jewish because obviously he's not a Holocaust denier. Uh, he pointed out that there were seven or eight polls done recently. No fanfare about those polls because they were issued by left wing organizations. So I'm even though I'm a libertarian, which is not really right wing because I don't care who, who marries who. And I don't have a right wing orthodoxy. I'm more of a libertarian uh, because I sided up with Trump. I've got to be demolished and creamed and. You know, good luck, guys. It's not going to happen. As long as I'm above ground, that's not going to happen. But you, you touch on a point, actually, that's important and that we're trying to tie into the film. And just feel free to interrupt me, by the way, mm-hmm. if, if I say something, Jermaine. But the public shaming thing is so important because most people, if you get a, one fake story about you, your life is over. For me, they call me everything. And I just joke about I link to the articles. I think they're funny. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, so... So here, here's the move of, to discredit people. It's an age-old move. It probably was developed by Socrates. Okay, well, my first week at Harvard Law School, when I was in the trial advocacy class, what the professor said was, if you're wrong on the facts, hit the other side in an ad hominem sort of a way to deconstruct the opposing side to the jury. If you disfigure and get the jury to hate that person, even if they're right, the jury will side with you. So get your likability up. It's all these soft things, okay, and destroy the other person. So, so the left does a phenomenal job of that. I give them a lot of credit. Uh, they write fake news stories all the time. They try to push people into that shame box. Uh, uh, but guys like me, guys like a Michael Cernovich, they're not going to sit stand for that. You know, I, I grew up in a pretty tough neighborhood. Uh, I find it laughable that these guys think that a couple words written about me on the Internet or the front page of a, of a story is a big deal. Okay, I mean, I saw, you know, a lot of messy stuff growing up as a kid, so that doesn't bother me at all. But there's no question that that's the strategy, and they ruin a lot of people's lives with that strategy or not capable of fighting back. So my message to people is if you're going to be in the arena with these people, they're going to use those uh, nasty, nefarious uh, tools against you, learn how to be resilient, learn how to fight back, and remember what your grandmother told you, what other people think of you is none of your business. Focus on what you think is right and go right at these people. And on that vein, let's talk about that CNN article. There was a big article, big scoop, that you were under investigation for colluding with Russia. Yeah. And then a few hours later, poof, the story disappeared. So what basically happened uh, to me with the CNN investigation and the eventual firing of those journalists and the fake news story is that I was in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum, and I ran into uh, one of the guys that works for the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund. He came over to me in a restaurant and said hello. We had a six to seven minute conversation, all of which was quite, you know, superficial. Uh, One of the journalists there took a picture of the two of us talking, Trump, uh, soon to be administration official, talking to Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund. And so at Steve Mnuchin's nomination hearing two days later, Senator Warren uh, said, well, are you going to investigate Anthony Scaramucci for his ties to Russia? At which point, uh, Stephen said, or Secretary Mnuchin said, yes, if that's what, you know, if he did something, of course, we'd investigate it. There was nothing there. I had a six to seven minute conversation with the guy. And so somebody from inside the White House, this is the problem with the Republicans, they like shooting at each other from inside the tent. Democrats have a way of Unify, even though they hate each other, you know, like Bill Clinton hates Hillary Clinton. They both hate Barack and Michelle Obama, but they walk hand in hand like a chorus line on Broadway. Right. But the Republicans try to kill each other, me and Bannon or Priebus and me and all this sort of nonsense. So somebody inside the White House leaked a story about me saying that I was under Senate and Treasury investigation, both of which was not true. I told the reporter that called me to please call Mitch McConnell's office or the head of communications at Treasury they will verify that it's not true. But they don't want to do that. They know my name gets them a lot of clicks and they know that it's just one story and a guy like me would likely not fight back over it. And so they published a story. And so I said, okay, that's it. I hired an attorney. I got on the phone with senior management at CNN. And I said, this is an absolutely total fake story about me. New York Times versus Sullivan. I took constitutional law at Harvard Law School. You can't write fake stories about a public figure. 
And so I'm going to bury you guys. Okay, this will be a $100 million lawsuit. And if you don't take the story down immediately, uh, I'm coming after you guys. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the FCC and I'm going to file a claim to make you lose your license because you do have an integrity obligation to get these FCC licenses. So inside of like five or six hours, they called me back and said, OK, the story is false. And then they took the steps of firing the people. And now, why did they fire those journalists? They fired those journalists because if I did actually bring the lawsuit, they wanted to separate the firm and the organization from the actual journalists. And so they were, they were mitigating their damages, and they were also mitigating the potential case that I had before the FCC. Uh, but that's not my personality. I'm not that kind of a guy. They apologized to me. Within minutes, I put out a apology accepted. Let's move on. And, that, and that's, that's how I am as a person. I'm not looking to fight with people or have a litigation, but I'm looking for fairness. I'm no longer looking for objectivity from the mainstream media because that's not part of their fragmented business model. But I am looking for fairness and integrity. You can't write stories that are full of lies, OK, to mislead the American people without having people like Mike Cernovich or myself or other people like us calling you out on it. So that's the good news for the American people. Right. Yeah. I, what I thought was interesting was that the story CNN tried to share was once we found out it was wrong, we retracted it, and they completely left out the part about the $100 million lawsuit you're going to bring. And then that was reported a couple of days later on page six. So CNN actually tried to act like, oh, no, we found out it was wrong, and we just voluntarily took it down because that's what we do, and we're just great people. Well, I mean, listen, in, 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 I'm, I'm going to try as super hard to be as fair as I can be to CNN. Um, I do think from time to time you can get a story wrong. I, I know I've had information when I was a host of Wall Street Week that was factually inaccurate, but I thought it was accurate. I really thought in my heart I was a- operating with integrity, but in fact, I got the story wrong. So I don't want to sit here and say that every fake news story that's out there, the person maliciously knows that it's fake. I will say that the people at CNN that I got to that realized the story was fake, they did move quickly and they did move honorably. But I do think that there is also a nefarious element where there was a group of people inside of CNN that said, oh, my God, this guy's got a deep enough pocket to sue us. He's a forceful enough media personality where he could hit us hard. And so they started taking those steps uh, to to fire people and to get themselves prepared. So, So, yeah, it was a combination of two things. But let me tell you this. If I was a... Joe Schmo of a guy, not saying I'm not a Joe Schmo of a guy, because I sort of am, but I do have a little bit of dough. If I didn't have a little bit of dough uh, to be able to fight them, I didn't have a little bit of courage and conviction, uh, they would have rolled me very, very hard. I would have been another casualty of theirs on, their, on the dustbin of their uh, shaming history of people like me. Just not going to happen, though. How do you define fake news? Fake news is a purposeful nefarious lie that's perpetrated by a group of people that want to discredit people that they disagree with. It primarily comes from the left because what we find on the right is that we're open to the conversation. We're open to the exchange and discourse of ideas. Okay. Even, uh, you know, Anderson Cooper or one of the CNN guys, maybe it was Brian Stelter, uh, had an issue and Sean Hannity went and defended him. And Sean basically said, hey, you know, uh, they have the right to say what they're saying. And so you can't blow them up or throw them off the air because you don't like what they're saying. And so I respect that about Sean. I respect that from most of the pundits from the right. The left, however, and this is the truth about the left, they're primarily 100 percent wrong about their ideas. They have very, very good intentions. I'm not saying they don't. But what you find about left wing philosophy, it's very well intended but the actual application of those policies is a disaster for a society. And so you can't take away the incentives in a human society. So, so the left gets that wrong. They know it's wrong. And so what they have to do is they have to silence the right. So the great irony of the liberal mind is that they're about fascism and silencing the right. And so one of the things that you learn about fascism is that you have to distort the truth, right? If you read Joe Goebbels, uh, Joseph Goebbels' biography, uh, the bigger the lie, the more impact and the more believable it'll be. And so that's coming from the left. Now, the left will be super mad at me for saying that, but that's actually the truth. It's just the way it works. And so us on the right or us that are libertarians that want a freer society, 
less government, more empowerment for the individual, we have to fight back against that because that's organized. That's organized. That's a group of people that think that they're smarter than the other group of people. No right. good. Yeah, so one, th yeah, one thing I was actually kind of thinking about, and we talk about the film as edited versus unedited TV, and what I've noticed is when the left tried to take over talk radio with Air America, it was a big kind of fail. So my, my perspective is that right-wing media prefers unedited TV because we know, hey, if you actually listen to what we're saying and not the caricature, we think that we're going to win. We can go on for hours. And that's why edited TV is primarily a left-wing media mechanism. Yeah, you know, I think I think that left wing talk radio and in general a lot of left wing television gets less ratings has to do with the fact that it is so mainstream. It's like such a big part of the voice and market share that people are sort of tone deaf to it. The reason why right wing talk radio or right leaning television galvanizes a lot of viewers is because the country is primarily center right. And the country's like, whoa, that's so refreshing that there's actually somebody on the TV that I can identify with. I think you find in the, uh, the coastal cities, uh, the coastal cities are probably more focused on the left-leaning stuff, but the heartland of America is probably more center-right. So I think that's the big difference between left-wing, why they don't get the ratings that the right-wing gets, so to speak. Yeah, more, more people. And the, the left being in the coastal cities tend to think that whatever happens in New York or D.C. is all that matters in the world. Yeah, I think it's a nexus between New York, D.C., San Francisco, and L.A. You can say some elements of Chicago, but not all elements of Chicago, and perhaps Miami. Those are the cities that are really driving the cultural left-wing zeitgeist. And so, and by the way, for myself, I'm actually okay with some of that. You know, I view myself as a socially inclusive person and a fiscally responsible one. Uh, I don't like saying I'm socially liberal because we've spent billions of dollars on that word getting half of America to hate the word liberal. I don't like saying I'm fiscally conservative because we did the same thing, billions of dollars to hate the word conservative and get the American people to hate that word. So to me, I think the middle mainstream of the country uh, probably wants a smaller energetic government that's held accountable uh, we got to get term limits in there. We got to get these bozos out of there that have permanentized themselves in the artifice of our, uh, our 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 country. It's just unbelievable. I think George Washington would be like throwing up if he knew that there were guys, men and women, staying 40 years in Washington. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And so, if you know anything about uh, citizen responsible government, you go, you serve your term, you pick the decisions and policies that are right for the American people. You don't focus on left or right and curry favor for lobbyists. You focus on right or wrong. Okay, we're not doing that anymore, okay? We've got a cesspool. I mean, I don't even think, I mean, honestly, I don't even think it's a swamp. I think it's like a gold-plated hot tub at this point, you know? So, so to me, we got to crush these guys, and I expect that we will. So what I want to talk a little bit about is how your life changed media-wise because I remember you, like, from a few years ago, you went from the media loved you, you were a great guest, you're charismatic, you're charming, to then suddenly you're speaking out for Trump, and then the media took a different turn on you. So what was it like going from kind of a beloved media person? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, when I started out in my media foray, uh, I was mostly a television business commentator. Then I started commentating a little bit on politics, so I was helping Governor Romney in his campaign. Uh, and I, I and just to state the facts for me, I was with Scott Walker and then Jeb Bush. I eventually got to Mr. Trump, then Mr. Trump, because of the uh, team nature of played team sports my whole life. He was going to win. I always said I was going to support the nominee. And so I went full in for the nominee. However, because of uh, President Trump's personality, the left wing media wants to knock his block off and they want to hate upon every single person in his orbit. So. Uh, I started to get tainted with and painted with that brush, so to speak. And my attitude on this is fine. I haven't changed one bit. And so I am the same exact guy that the media liked five years ago that now 60 or 70 percent of the media hates. And that's fine. What I, what I find ironic about this, and I actually had this conversation with the president uh, on my second day on the job, uh, it, we, we were talking about how the negativity in the media perversely is galvanizing. So 
uh, I find that when the, the I have there's a direct functionality between the media hitting me and the American people liking me. It's a direct functionality, and I would say that's probably also true for Mike Cernovich. The more the mainstream media hits you, Mike Cernovich, the more galvanized people are around you. And so, so the, the so the American people are now in on the joke of the devious manipulation. Just think about what the media was like in their feeding frenzy during the campaign. And Donald J. Trump still won the presidential election. She had 75, 80% of the media behind her. She outspent us 1.6 to one. She outmanned and womened us in terms of personnel. Uh, I think she was uh, two to one to us on on personnel. Uh, And she had a voter registration of seven to five in terms of Democrats versus Republicans that were eligible to vote in the election, and she still lost. You can just imagine if we had more balance in the media, less fake news, less of that garbage, how powerful we would be because our ideas are right. I mean, it's not about left or right, it's about right or wrong. Yeah, you said something actually profound and it's something I've thought about, which is it used to be the media wrote a hit piece on you, that's it, man, your life's over. And now a hit piece is being being viewed as like a status marker, like, wow, the New York Times wrote a hit piece on that guy. I don't even know what they said about him, but it must be amazing and he must be a great person. Yeah, I think I think these hit pieces that uh, 15, 20 years ago would have meant character assassination, suicide, and the person would then have to remove themselves from public life are, are no longer because there's so much disingenuous activity in the media uh, when, if I'm getting a hit piece written about me from the New York Times, like, oh, OK, New York Times, super biased, absolutely hate Trump. He's affiliated with Trump. They're hitting him. They must be worried about him. You see, the, the, the way I was getting hit, uh, one of my buddies said to me, you're getting hit like that because you can articulate the president's strategy. I'll tell a very quick story. I'm on BBC Newswatch and I'm being interviewed by Emily and it's a live presentation. I've got the White House behind me. And we're talking, it's over, I shake her hand, I'm walking to my office in the West Wing. My cell phone's ringing, I pick up the cell phone, I'm not gonna tell you who it was, but it was a person in Republican opposition research for 30 years. They said, Ant, you're in a lot of trouble. I said, I'm in a lot of trouble, why? Yes, I just watched you on BBC News Watch. They're trying to disfigure you and two-dimensionalize you as an Italian street thug. But you just, you had great verbal dexterity on BBC News Watch, And they're now saying, my God, this guy might be able to have tea with the queen. And I've gotten four or five calls on you since you finished that interview saying, what do you got on this guy? We got to take this guy out. Why do you got to take me out? Because I'm not part of the permanent political class. You got to take me out because I'm a business executive and I can smell the rotting cadaver of Washington that sits in the basement of the American public and the American community. And I'm ready to help the American people remove the cadaver from the basement. So they're going to hit me. They're going to disfigure me. They're going to malign guys like Mike Cernovich. And I'm totally cool with it. I wear it as a badge of honor. And I also find that the, it galvanizes a large group of supporters around me. But, but I just thought it was fascinating. I'm on the BBC. I'm walking back into the West Wing. And I'm being told by Republican Party opposition research that they're calling around trying to figure out a way to take me out. Yeah, that's something that a lot of people don't realize, how nasty Republicans are to each other. Yeah. Oh, no, the Republicans are very, very nasty to each other, uh, and they make a very big mistake with that. That schism inside the party has to end. Uh, Even if Steve Bannon is right on some of the stuff that he's saying, uh, look at the way the founders put the country together. All of us are byproducts of this amazing country. Again, my parents are blue collar people. I was able to rise in class as a result of this country. My life story doesn't happen in any other country. And so the founders wanted us to collaborate. The founders wanted us to go for, as Reagan said, 80% of what we wanted, recognizing that we could never get 100% of what we wanted. And so I find that some of these Republican ideologues are messianic bomb throwers, uh, and they're not gonna get the job done for the American people. And whether we like it or not, the you know, the Bible says that the poor and the rich will always be among us. Well, so will the left wing, fellas. Okay, just the way it works. Okay, so we have to figure out a way to collaborate with them and outman them with our ideas because our ideas are better. Uh, uh, Trump won because his ideas were better. Look at how the economy's growing. Look at how people feel about the American society now economically. 
uh, if, if, if a Republican establishment figure won or Hillary Clinton won, there's no way there'd be a $5 trillion boost in the stock market since the election. No way. Yeah, it's just, that's another kind of point I wanted to touch on, which is that if you watch the news, you think America's about to go into another depression. But if you follow the statistics, it just hit that GDP was up 3% last quarter. So the big, the big fallacy about the news now, in addition to fragmenting so that they can achieve their business model by attracting a certain genre of viewers, uh, there is a mass hysteria. There's breaking news, breaking news every 15 seconds, and you don't know what the hell is going on. There's a Malaysian airline. We're going to talk about that for two years. You got uh, the economy is going to fall into, uh, into a cliff and all this sort of nonsense. But at the end of the day, it's not really what's going on in, in the real society. Moreover, the media wants you to feel that the society is way more polarized than it actually is. At the end of the day, most people want to get along with each other. Uh, they don't really care about it the way these Washingtonians or these media pundits do. So, so the economy is actually doing quite well. Um, the one problem that I have uh, is that the lower and middle class are not getting enough of the piece of the action of our economic opportunity and growth. That's bad policy. That's all it is. You don't have to invoke socialism or communism to spread the wealth. What you have to do is just come up with the right policy and the right incentives so that people can get paid more money. Uh, corporations that pay their people more money, maybe you give them a little bit of a tax incentive to do that. Uh, and, and, and these business executives should know that by paying their employees more money, there's more aggregate demand in the economy, which will lead to more compensation for them. Okay, it's just a, it's a longer term strategy and we've got to start getting back to that. Uh, and that's something I wish the president felt like he would talk more about, because he's, he, he was very good at that at the Trump organization. Yeah, let's talk about that. What should the White House be talking about more? Well, I think, you know, listen, I put a full, fully blown, and, and Michael Cernovich was uh, great enough to leak it out there for me, not leak it, but put it out there. I had a seven or eight page communication strategy, and I think there were three components of that that were usually important. Number one, the president has to go outside of the beltway into the heartland of the American people and literally activate the American people like it's his congressional liaison office. They have to overwhelm the Capitol Dome with calls and literally tilt the Capitol Dome. Uh, because if they don't do that, the permanent political class will reject the president's agenda. They do not want this president to succeed because he's now opened the door for other billionaire entrepreneurs. It's not just the right leaning ones. They don't want Mark Zuckerberg to be president. They don't want Jeff Bezos to be president. How, Jeff Bezos worth $90 billion. He shows up in the Oval Office. Do you think he cares about the business model of the swamp? He'll want to break up and disrupt the whole thing and try to serve the American people. So, so what these guys are trying to do is they're trying to kill Trump. And so one, one component of the communication was get outside of the beltway and activate the American people to tilt the Capitol Dome. The second thing I think they have to do is use the presidency as a bully pulpit to explain all of the good things that are going on in our society now as a re direct result of the president's policies. We are eviscerating ISIS. We are going to end up with a positive negotiated deal with North Korea because of the president's tough stance. We're growing the economy faster now than we were even a year ago. We're unleashing investment and economic opportunity. The society will become fairer as a result of these policies. And so the president controls the bully pulpit and the daily news cycle. We need more content, enriched content related to that. And the third thing that we need to do is we need to out media the media. OK, and what the president needs, I believe, is almost like a counter offensive strategy with the media. And one of the things I wrote in my comms plan is that we would return every call. We get back to them immediately. We rebut every angle of their attack. Uh, because I do feel that the Bush administration in the last two years, 2006 to 2008, they were steamrolling him and he took a break and he basically went to Camp David or he went down to his ranch and he didn't fight them every single day. And so one of my components of my media plan was 24 hour crisis return, 24 hour flip it back to them uh, and continue to defend and fight for the president. And so unfortunately, in my opinion, He's a little weakened there. He needs to fortify that better uh, with more, more. I mean, Hope and Sarah are terrific people. I'm not saying anything bad about them. He just needs more of them uh, to help him uh, on the surrogacy side, et cetera. 
Yeah, Hope and Sarah are good. What, what I always thought they should do, and, and you touched on your memo, is there should be an in-house media production company in the White House. Yeah. Well, I always thought there should be an in-house media production company in the White House uh, because it's a new generation now of new media. And so, you know, one of the criticisms would be, well, it would be Pravdo. It would be like a state-owned media organization. But I never felt that way. I thought we could have set it up, and I explained this to the president when I was there, uh, that you could set this up and you could put it in place and you could permanentize it for the next president. And so whether it's a Democrat or a Republican that enters the office, they have this set up the same way you have the press room set up and the briefing apparatus set up for a Republican or Democratic president. But I think the world has changed and the president needs a narrative creating production product every day to help him get his uh, message out there so that it's not blunted by the ridiculous fragmentation that's gone on in the media. Yeah, why do you think they don't do more live streams on YouTube, Facebook, Periscope? I've never understood that. I think, I think one of the reasons why the White House is reluctant to use live streaming on Facebook and all this other stuff, it has to do with the White House Counsel's Office. They're very worried that a piece of confidential information could come out or something unplugged, which could be a violation of national security. I could have a security clearance and I'm asked something about Korea and I say something, you know, and it's unplugged, but there's a periscope involved. And then all of a sudden I, I breached the national security protocol, you know. So, so I think that's one of the reasons. But again, one of the components of my plan was to even screen for that and say, OK, we're going on periscope. Here are the do's and don'ts. Let's get some fresh authenticity out there, unscripted. I think what the American people like about the media rogues uh, that are sometimes represented by the Cernovich clan, et cetera, is they like the unscripted authenticity of those people. Uh, even my profanity-laced interview, which I really wish wasn't made public, I mean, the guy was very dishonest. Again, I didn't say off the record, so I have to own it, but it was just a, it was outside of the spirit of human relationships, what he did to me. Just shows you how scummy some of these people are. But at least the good news is what I said, when people said, well, did you say it? I said 100% I said it. I owned 100% of it. Uh, and I didn't even know he had a recording of me. I wasn't going to walk it back because that's not my personality. And I think the American people want that freshness. They want that authenticity. And I think down deep, they like that from the president. Yeah, I think that one reason, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree, one reason that they don't go live is they're afraid not only the national security, but well, you might say one sentence wrong that's going to be taken out of context and that'll spin into a whole news cycle. Yeah, I think that's a mistake. If, if they are making a judgment of not going live on Periscope because the answers won't be super canned and homogenized and there won't be one sentence that can get pulled out of there and blown out of proportion, I think that's a huge mistake because, again, what I have found with the media, let them blow it out of proportion. Because when, when it is blown out of proportion, the average person will look at it and say, hmm, that's been blown out of proportion by the media. I have a soft spot now for the guy that they're blowing out of proportion. I find that uh, it, when you overly can something, uh, like uh, a group of guys are doing a documentary on me, and I gave them complete access and unrestricted editorial artistic capability. Some of the stuff is absolutely terrible about me. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it as like Ryan Lizza going off on me. I'm like, oh my God, this is terrible. But in, in my mind, it's actually the opposite. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to be in a position where you're forcing people to like you or you're canning a documentary like an infomercial. You want to offer a balance to people and let the people themselves decide on what is good or bad about the person or what is good or bad about the policy. And so I think that unplugged stuff is the future. I mean, we've been li living in a reality TV world since like 1999, 2000. Um, unplugged, unscripted is what the millennials are used to. And let's give them more of that. They'll feel more comfortable and they'll feel a lot more trust and authenticity in their public servants if we go in that direction. Yeah, that's one thing that I've, I've said, for example, people go, how do you describe what you do? And I go, well, I call it reality news. And they go, why? Well, I go, there is no fourth wall. There is no barrier. There is no kind of camp production. And that is what people want. We're entering an era of authenticity where everybody feels like they're lied to, the mm -hmm. TV's lying, the politics are lying. They just want like a real guy or a real girl. Yeah, I think, I think the inauthentic, overly staged, canned political presentations 
are over. And thank God for that. I think Donald J. Trump, some presidential historian 50 years from now, will write that uh, President Trump broke the mold and he stopped the digestible soundbite and the overly canned, homogenized BS that comes out of a politician's mouth. And so I think that's a positive thing on both sides. It's a positive thing. Yeah, I even, um, I forget, uh, the V.O. Robicon actually wrote it. I don't know if you read his stuff. He's famous for venture capital tech startup. And he said the next president in 2020 will be like the first GoPro president. You're going to have mm -hmm. a guy or a girl who everywhere they go, there's just GoPros. Yeah. No secret meetings, no this, unless it's Well, that was in David, Egg in David Egger's book, The Circle. Uh, he wrote about what what's being referred to as the GoPro president, where you have a police camera on you or a helmet cam, and and people are able to then purvey and look into everything that you're doing. Uh, what David Egger said in the book The Circle is that politicians would either elect for full transparency or a lack of transparency, and that the voters would shift their mindset to go with the politicians that are offering full transparency. The one the one issue I had with David Egger's book The Circle or the notion of the GoPro presidency, is you gotta be very careful that you don't create a dystopian society. Because at the end of the day, uh, there is a sacredness to some private conversations. There is a sacredness to a one-on-one -on -one interaction with somebody that's held dear to both of those people. So, so we just have to manage that. But I do predict that the people that are talking about a GoPro presidency or full transparency for politicians, I do predict that that trend will be there very shortly. Yeah, that will be in that direction. So sort of mm -hmm. I think I even noticed, for example, BuzzFeed is doing a lot of stuff that I was just doing on Periscope, where mm -hmm. they're like live streaming and everything now, and, and we'll get that with the politics. The um, so let's talk about sort of old media versus new media. What comes to your mind when I talk about that? Old media, I think of a 1950s, 1960s style paradigm where there are printing presses and there are large television stations and there are large production control companies uh, and there's magazine layout and seller, seven color processing. Uh, and so this is all remnants of the 50s and the 60s here in 2017 and 18. And so the big problem with that, since the introduction of the iPad in 2010 and other tablets, uh, we've dematerialized the world. Uh, we've shrunken down, the iPad represents all 50 of the magazine subscriptions that you want, all 20 of the newspapers that you want, even your film library, your television shows. So what, we've, what we're doing in our society now is we're dematerializing uh, what used to take lots of space, lots of energy. We're doing it in retail. Uh, people that are in the retail industry are suffering because Amazon is such a behemoth, you can one click it through your phone or your iPad and it comes to your house, why do you need to walk around in a shopping mall? So, so other than if you want that cultural interconnectivity. So, so, so what's happening now, old media has not made an adaptation, okay? It reminds me of Jerry Yang in the mid 90s, who was the founder of something called Yahoo. He marched into Pacific Bell and he went to those guys and said, hey, look at this cute algorithm. I'm calling it Yahoo. You type the name in and then it comes up on the World Wide Web. Michael Cernovich, there's his phone number or uh, Domino's Pizzeria, there's the local phone number, and you can buy this from me for a million dollars. And the Pac Bell executive said, why would we do that? We're killing millions of trees, and we're building four pound yellow stained phone books that we're delivering to everybody's house, and why would we need this? This is our business model. And so uh, I take you to that story because what's happening now is very, very disruptive to that old style footprint. Mike Cernovich with an iPhone, he's got a radio communications company, a television studio, a film production company in his hand. It has the processing capability that is two times now uh, what put the, the men on the moon in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And so that power, that capability, that dematerialization is where the paradigm is. As an example, and, and, and based on a recommendation from Michael Cernovich, I started something called the Scaramucci Post. It's in an experimental phase, but we realized that we need very few employees. And before you know it, we could have an aggregation site that rivals other aggregation sites at a very, very low cost. And so old media, it's dying. They can't move fast enough. It's literally like they're in the horse and buggy era, and there's this thing coming that's called the horseless carriages, and they don't want to switch gears in time. So many of these people are going to get melee. 
Yeah, you got into um, a new media startup company. What are your thoughts with that? Well, listen, my, it's very experimental right now, but uh, what I have found that uh, I think there was probably a billion to a billion and a half dollars of name recognition, free media associated with my firing from the White House. Uh, and I think that I've done a reasonably good job of articulating the president's strategy and a reasonably good job of handling myself on TV and radio. And so I have a voice. Now, I know that all the bots that hit me on the internet say that I don't have a voice and my 15 minutes are over and all this sort of nonsense. But at the end of the day, I have a voice. And so I'm going to use this platform to aggregate ideas and themes related to what I think can work for our society, make our society better. And so, again, if it's a left-leaning idea, but I think it's applicable, it'll be on that site. If it's a right-leaning idea, it'll be on, on that site. I'm politically, from a philosophical point of view, quite agnostic. I'm just really looking for ideas that will progress the society and make it better. I, I, my number one thing at this point in my life, given my relative level of success, is I want to ensure that children that grew up, or that are growing up in 2017, the way I grew up in 1975, have the same opportunities that I had. I was in a blue collar family, on the product of a public school, very good public school, went on to an Ivy League law school after Tufts and made myself a level of financial independence. I want to have people that grew up similarly situated to me have that same opportunity. And I can tell you the data right now is against those people. Uh, the schools have gotten way more uneven. Uh, the socioeconomic classes have gotten way more stratified. The tax structure is not really benefiting those people. Uh, and so there's a lot that we can do to change it. We can also do things on the trade side globally that will help bolster the lower and middle class of the United States. And so these, those are the things I'm going to be working on. What's one question you wish somebody would ask you? I guess the most fascinating question that I've never been asked is why are you doing this? Why are you out there? Uh, you have a good life. You could hang out in your suburban home and hang out with your kids and, you know, have enough money to travel and sort of do whatever you want. So why are you doing this? Okay. And so because there's a lot of negatives to this, okay? I mean, this is the conversation that I've had with the president. You know, the president's given up multiple billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of opportunities to go run the White House. Why are you doing it? And so the nefarious people, they would say, I'm doing it because I'm drunk on power or I have some level of narcissism and all that sort of nonsense. But if someone really asked me, hey, Anthony, why are you doing this, okay? I would say... I'm doing it because I want to cheat history. I want to help the country cheat history. Republics typically last 240 years. And if we don't reset the country and reset the social contract, uh, we, have, we run the risk of, and again, I'm not talking about a revolution, but we run the risk of turning the country into something different than what it was that we grew up in. Uh, uh, I grew up in the opportunistic, I grew up in the aspirational working class. The working class today is desperational. And so the reason I'm doing it is I want to really help that because the country's been so good to me. I'm willing to take the hits. You know, so if there's Holocaust deniers out there and I want people to know that over 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust and somebody's going to accuse me of being a Holocaust denier for that, I'll take the hit. If I think the president has the right economic or regulatory strategy, and they're going to disfigure me and call me a misogynist and a, and a racist, but I know these are the right strategies to help the American people, no problem. I'll take the hit. Uh, but no one's ever asked me why am I doing it, and that's the reason. Yeah, do you feel like people in media, when they interview you, actually want to get to know who you are, or they just want to sound like? I would say 80% of the people that have interviewed me in the media are looking for a sound bite, a news story, clickbait, something salacious, that they can go to their suits and say, look at, you know, I brought this story. It led to this level of viewers or this level of eyeballs. And I would say there's 20% of those people that are actually intellectually curious and are really trying to get to the truth, you know. But what I find is like, like um, I don't like the uh, crowd think in the media. 
We put out this Holocaust poll. It was absolutely stupid to do it, by the way. I think we didn't offer enough context. But like the notion of somebody like Stephanie Rule, who I considered a friend, lighting me up on Twitter in some like maniacal faux rage, I find it very dishonest. You know, it's like, I'm gonna be part of this media cabal and I'm gonna run with the pack in a way so that everyone knows that I hate Donald J. Trump and I hate this, these are all evil people and blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of BS, you know, nobody. Here's a big lesson for people that are watching this documentary. Nobody is the way they are actually portrayed in the media. Everybody is very, very different. I find that when I give these public speeches around the country, I come off the podium and somebody says to me, oh man, I didn't realize you were like this because they, they try to portray you this way. You know, I was at a college. This is a cute story. I can't give up the name of the college. I signed a confidentiality, but uh, it was a parent teacher weekend, 26 students. They got together and they voted on the one person they wanted to come to college to be the keynote speaker for their parent teacher weekend. And the 26 kids picked me. It's very flattering. But the university president was like, no way, we're not bringing him, okay? And so they were like, no, no, we're bringing him. And so I went and I gave a uh, one hour talk and I gave uh, 45 minutes of questions and answers at the end. When I came off the podium, you, the university pre president walked over to me and says, you know, I was wrong. I, I, I should have allowed you to speak. I, I didn't, they've disfigured you in a way where I thought you were not gonna talk with the intellectual gravity and the historical context that you're capable of talking. So that's that's one of the nightmares of what I have to live with right now, temporarily. Yeah, we, we had a weird sort of epiphanous <clears throat> moment like that after the Floor Ball inauguration party I organized with uh, Jeff Giese, and it was at the press club. And at the end of it, because you know, we had a hard time finding venues, and the press club president was there, and I like shook his hand. I go, hey man, thanks for everything. And he goes, no, thank you. You you guys were all so nice. I had no idea. Because there were over a thousand of us, and there wasn't a single fight not a single you know, unkind word. He's like, I had no idea that this is how you people really no. are. So, yeah, they, they got to, look, you're, you're threatening the status quo. You're threatening the establishment. They have to throw a bomb at you. They have to crush you and they have to crush your personality. Otherwise, they don't really have a game. You know, where are they going to go? Uh, where, where are they going to debate me? Uh, I, I, Lawrence O'Donnell, who is, probably has the IQ of a mule, how is he going to debate somebody like me? What topic do you want to debate on? I'll go all night with you on any topic that you want, okay? And so all he'll do is get super frustrated and, and call me names and ad hominem attack me, you know? So it's fine. I'm, I'm a big boy. I can handle it. Well, yeah, I was six foot four when I started with Trump. I'm now like 4'11", but I'm okay. Well, that's the power, too, of long-form unedited content. Right. As people can find out who you really are, which is why it surprises me more people in media aren't doing a Joe Rogan style podcast. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I think people in the media are making a mistake of still putting on the hairspray and the makeup and scripting uh, when they are going to galvanize more viewers and a wider berth of viewers ideologically if they unscript and unplug themselves. Yeah, I, I thought the Joe Rogan podcast would be it's a scalable model that should be done in media. And I don't know why more people aren't doing that. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think the Joe, the Ro Joe Rogan model and the unscripted stuff is great, but I think that the problem is the paradigm in the old media has not shifted enough. You know, there's a, I have a hard time getting cell phone service here in Midtown Manhattan because these cell phone towers are built in the 1980s. But if I go to a suburb of Beijing, I get pistol quick cell phone service, okay? So what happened is, it's the paradox of progress, okay? They skipped over the copper wires and they skipped over the 1980s cellular technology and they're installing 2017 cellular technology and it's pistol fast. Uh, we, we suffer in the United States from the paradox of progress. Our airports were made in the 1930s and the 1940s and so that footprint is aging on us while they have these beautiful gleaming airports in Dubai or Beijing. And so that's the same thing in the media. The media is suffering from, they got there first, they had an operating model that worked in the 50s, 60s, and possibly 70s. It's not necessarily working in 2017. And then someone will push back and say, well, it is, we're super, super profitable. Yes, you are, but you're losing your integrity and you're losing your voice to the American people. Uh, and you're allowing new media, unscripted, reality news to take over and be that voice of honesty and objectivity to the American people. 
what advice would you give? Imagine a, you know, they, they invite you up to CNN and all the executives are there and the, the anchors are there. And they said, look, we really want to do better. We're, we're, we want to hear what would you tell us, what one piece of advice would you give people in traditional media? I, the first thing I do is start a new CNN. I would look at Cernovich's model and other new media models, and I'd start new CNN, and I would fund new CNN, and I would fund it separately, and I would have it compete with old CNN. Uh, and the best example I can give on that is uh, in 1994, 1995, Bill Gates said that the internet was a joke, and it was a temporary fad. And then it dawned on him the power of the, at that time, it was called Netscape, the browser. He was like, oh my God, all these people that are using this browser, I am completely wrong. And so he adapted and pivoted and he went out and he asked the question, he said, how many people are being employed right now in the internet? And they said 3,000. He said, okay, that's great. We're going to put this building here in Seattle, Washington or Redmond, Washington, and we're going to put 3,000 people in it. And he immediately went out and created Internet Explorer, and he made an adaptation and pivot. Even though it was off his business model, it was off his core operating system business model, he literally created new Microsoft alongside of old Microsoft, and it frankly saved the company. And so if I was sitting with Jeff Zucker at CNN or one of these guys, I'd say, go create new CNN right now and allow new CNN to compete with old CNN. And Steve Jobs would tell you that, you know. Steve Jobs took a Glock and he capped the iPod. Why'd you kill the iPod, Steve? Well, if someone was going to kill it, it might as well have been me. And he embedded all the mechanisms of that iPod into the iPhone. And so now the iPod is completely obsolete. It was going to happen anyway. You know, uh, look, at, look at what's happened to film. You know, we used to go and get a roll of film, Kodak film, put it in the back of a camera, and that's been annihilated. Somebody had to do it. Kodak actually had the patents on They did. They had the patents on the digital technology. But again, you, know, you, you, you don't think that CNN with their footprint and their media capability could create an unbelievable, fresh, new CNN? They absolutely could, but they don't want to disrupt their existing business model. So they'll end up hurting themselves in the long run. But all the great companies take a Glock to their existing business model and they cap it. And, and if you don't do that, you're going to end up getting meleeed by, you know, renegades and guerrilla warfare, guerrilla mindset people like Mike Cer Cernovich. That's what's going to happen. What would the new CNN look like? It would be small. It would be equipped with iPhones and it would be racy. It would be unscripted. It would be uh, getting the news uh, from places like the White House and traditional content but also it would be newer sourcing, newer ideas, and it would be rogue. It would be rogue. It would be a different culture and a different business model, and it would galvanize people very quickly. You know, there's a, there, there was a, when I was a kid, there was a brewery called Red Dog Brewery. Most of the, the great irony now is most of these micro breweries are owned by Anheuser-Busch or Miller Brewery. And, but they know that they have to have these micro breweries out there to give taste uh, selectivity and, and make people feel that they're in an avant-garde trying something new. CNN should be doing that, so should these other me media news outlets. What were some of the worst examples of fake news uh, during the election? So, I mean, the, the biggest fake news story of our generation, in my opinion, is the Russian collusion slash faux fake news story related to the president and his campaign and the Russian government or whatever they're talking about, Russian hackers or Russian influence, uh, I just think it's totally bogus and unfair. I'm not saying that the Russians aren't hacking in our system or trying to hack our water grid or may have some fake bots out there that are trying to influence the election. I didn't say, I, I don't know if that's true or it isn't true, but I know definitively that we were not colluding with the Russians to try to beat Hillary Clinton. So there was no uh, sovereign state interference uh, and by the way, you know, whatever people say about the president, he's a, he's a stand up guy when it comes to that sort of stuff. He won the election fair and square. He didn't have to do anything like that. Yeah, I told him, I go, people ask me about it, I go, look, man, the campaign didn't even coordinate with social media on the internet, which was like huge on Twitter. People forget, people forget today, I'll make this statement because I was there. People forget today 
how disorganized and how entrepreneurially lunatic oriented we were inside that campaign. And so it just wa- it wasn't that kind of a campaign. And by the way, let me state this for the record, and I hope you're really listening, and I do hope this makes the documentary. President Donald J. Trump carried every one of us over the finish line. Steve Bannon didn't make him president. Uh, Kelly and Conway didn't make him president. I didn't make him president. Ryan Priebus didn't make him president. Donald J. Trump made himself president, and he pulled every single one of us over the finish line with him. And so I find it very disingenuous when people think that they put him in that office because it was the very opposite. Well, victory has a thousand masters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So my my opinion of the race baiting that's going on and my opinion of the uh, portrayal of the social strife and the neo-Nazis and et cetera is another example of a business model by the mainstream cable news networks and media to try to gin up controversy and to try to create an environment of discontent. If you look at the population, uh, and by the way, I have nothing but disdain for Nazis. I, I, I think the whole Charlottesville thing, I, don't th- I think you have to have a zero tolerance policy on Nazis. But I think that there are a very, very small portion of the population And if this was the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, objectively, they wouldn't be worthy enough of the news standing that they're getting right now. So the the weird thing about it is they're calling me a Holocaust denier because I'm trying to let people know that 5 million, 6 million, 6.5 million people died in the Holocaust. But they're fueling the neo-Nazi or the Antifa, Antifa movement by putting them on the air. Just leave them alone. Get them off the air. You get them off the air, they'll stop protesting. No, I think I think that the media, I think that the media will gin up controversy, take things and blow them out of proportion to gin up ratings. These these chirons and graphics, breaking news and all this sort of hysteria is part of their business model. It glues people. It's addictive. Do you think the media covered up or just you know underreported the amount of violence against Trump supporters during the election? And if so, why do you think they did that? Well, I think the media, if some historian really gets a hold of, if some historian really gets a hold of objectively what happened during the campaign, they'll find that a lot of the violence at these Trump rallies was instigated by people that were against Trump. It wasn't really the Trump supporters themselves going after each other. So, so there's another fake news thing. The greatest thing that happened from that fake news situation is the American people knew better. Like, okay, there's the media trying to go after Mr. Trump, and I'm going to double make sure that I passionately go out and vote for him.